Hey, it's Greg of Adoptees United and What Next, the Adoptee Rights Podcast. Here's extended conversations I had with Shalise Gisicki of Adoption Mosaic, in which she talked about what would we do if we had infinite money. And the conversation starts off with the suggestion of expanded mental health resources, including a mental health clinic. And the conversation goes on from there. So enjoy this bonus material from episode three. Yeah. Oh, and then also a mental health clinic. Right. Yeah. That was Where a tough one. See, I, I, I immediately, so I, I should be, I immediately react to that. And I think it's privilege that's talking that it's like, well, I don't need that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like I'm, or, or, um, well, don't peg me as, as uh, having mental issues. Right, right. right. And, and, but at the same time, <laughs> that's in a lot of demand, actually. Yeah. 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 And just being able to understand, I mean, learn about trauma. Um, and even if it's creating adoptant, co- adoption competent therapists. Right. Like in a way that's not like they had like a two hour training at an adoption agency or something like that. I wonder, if that's, like, I wonder if that's a growing industry, basically. It'd be interesting, again, a research institute, look at how many adoption competent therapists have, have you know, developed, developed over time. Are they adoptees? What kind of experience do they have with adoption? Or is it just yeah. a market driven thing? know yeah and and i think you know like i don't yeah because there's definitely um i think there's more adoptee therapists Mm -hmm. oh i agree that number has definitely grown over time Mm -hmm. um but that doesn't make you adoption competent just because you're an adoptee Right. It's that difference between especially when you're dealing with something like mental health is like it's that difference between functioning in the micro level of your experience Mm -hmm. or being in the macro level of the industry and the system and being able to understand those two. Um, Because if you're still stuck in your own experience, then I get, and then this could be a debate to be had among mental health professionals, but I, you know, does that make you more effective? Does it make you less effective? I don't know. Right. Um, my therapist was not an adoptee. She was like an older white lady. <laughs> but did she immediately like hone in on an adoption as an, as an issue? Um, Cause no. that was, that's always um, been my experience is like, I always feel like I want to be broader. I want to break out of adoption and be broader than adoption. And then when you go to therapy, it's all focused in on the adoption. Which is probably this is probably why you need a therapist in the first place. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you're not seeing it, buddy. Come on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, well, and you know, I think part of the reason therapy is can be really challenging is that um, as adoptees, like we really crave belonging and stability mm-hmm. and. Um, certainty. Mm -hmm. And when you're questioning your family and your place in your family and that all the time, it's really hard. Like there's probably a reason many adoptees are averse to therapy is because we don't want to challenge that when we're, we're working so hard to be a part of our family or feel a part of our family or, or trying to fight the feeling of not feeling a part of our family. Like it would be really, really hard to do. And then all it takes, I mean, right. Cause we're adoptees. All it takes is like one person to tell us want no, or you're wrong. This one time we're like, okay, I'm <laughs> like, done. I'm walking out of here. Yeah. yeah. I can't do it. You know, it's like <laughs> one person tries to, you know, goes in somewhere and tries to get their birth certificate and some mean lady says no. And then you, you, it will take you years to go back to that because of that. I, I, that experience yeah. of rejection is is too overwhelming. Yeah, I think we don't often talk about how these lost years of where you were engaged in trying to look at this, and then something happened, and you disengaged for quite some time. I've I've had a yeah. ten year, I had a ten year period where I was out, and then I dived back right back in. But it was ten years. I took a DNA test or submitted a DNA sample, and it took me four and a half years to access the results of that. So seriously? So wait, it was sitting there waiting for you to sign in and look I, at, and then yep. and you didn't do it for four and a half years? 
Mm-mm. And then what finally made you say, hey, I'll, I'll punch in my password and see what it is? I started working at Adopt a Mosaic. Interesting. And then and you'd have conversations like, oh, with okay. Ostrid, or is it just more? Yeah. yeah. I just realized, like, I'm back into this network. I'm back with my people. If this explodes <laughs> in my right. face somehow, like, I'll, I'll have the support I need. You know, and part of, I mean, we talked about this internal work that we need to do. And I think it's true, too, to people who are new to advocacy or new to the space. I think those who have been in the space for quite some time are very dismissive of their new experience. And we have to be very careful with that. Especially, I always hate it when people are newly engaged in advocacy. They may, you know, they may not quite know what they're doing, and but they want to do something. And either one of two things happens. You, people say to them, well, we've done that before. It didn't work. And so that's really demeaning. And yeah, like, it doesn't mean you can't, you mean, you know, this person in front of me wants to do it again and maybe have a different approach, you know, it could work that way. And the other is like the, off, the, the comment, well, what have you done in this space before? Um, so you have to sort of be qualified in order to uh, get engaged. I mean, you do in some respect need to understand what's needed for advocacy, but those are the two that I've always seen to be really demeaning and depowering or disempowers people to get more involved. And yeah, it's a less it's a yeah. it's a less welcoming space than you would think. Uh, adopt yes. the adopt the activism, because there are established players typically is with any advocacy mm-hmm. you know, world, and they're controlling some of their power as well. I mean, their power yeah. within the advocacy I, and activism world. I like to call them adoptee famous. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that um, all of us who are involved in, you know, whether we consider ourselves activists or advocates, that we always have to look and look to ourselves all the time to see if we're doing that. Um, Yeah. Because Mm -hmm. it's, we're not going to, we're not going to grow the movement if we are selfish with the power we've been able to claim. And yeah, I, yeah. I, so, I, I, it's something I do worry about quite a bit, actually. Yeah, and the sharing you know, of, like the going sharing of this, power. Yeah, the idea of doing the fun social things is that intergenerational piece, right? Needs to be a part of it because what what I felt was a challenge as a child growing up or as a young person is going to be completely different than someone you know 20 years my junior right um and yet talking about looking forward like they're the people that we need to be working for like nothing i mean nothing's gonna undo what's been done to me so to speak Mm -hmm. like it's it's not gonna change like that's it is what it is and um you know, my whole idea is that you're changing it for people in the future. Right. And where are those voices and how, how yeah. are they being heard? And I assume you, I, I, I think of Adoption Mosaic as um, very much uh, keyed into those voices because of the diversity of programming. You're dealing with um, adoptive parents who may have young uh, adopted mm-hmm. kids. Yeah, and yeah. so you're here, you, even though you're, it's sort of that experience is being mediated through the adoptive parent, you are still learning what's what those issues are. I mean, I I yeah. participated, and I think you may have participated as a panelist on. Um, there's a university student adoptee group out in Oregon. I think they're pretty. Oh, active. Ostrid was a panelist. Oh, okay, yeah, and it was interesting yeah. to hear what their issues were. And there's a lot of intercountry adoptees. Um, mm-hmm. And I learned a lot. Um, what was big on their minds and what was not big on their minds as, as yeah. 18, 19, 20, 20, 21 year olds. It was a kind of a weird space because then the adoptive parents would come in and, um, and participate in um, these spaces. And it, it was, seemed a little awkward, I think, because of the age differences. I mean, you're not full. You are an adult, but not fully an adult at that point. Right. And so I'm not right. sure how I would have reacted if my mom or dad came in this space when I was 18 and 
talking yeah. about adoption where I haven't even I probably even wasn't even really thinking about it back then, but I certainly wasn't able to articulate it very well. But I think yeah, youth, to, youth today sure. are just blowing my mind actually with what they can articulate. Yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, how do we tap into or or how do we include those voices when I, I imagine there's some distrust there as well, generational distrust or racial yeah. distrust as well, because we're. Yeah, because I think like, but I think, you know, in as in general, as a society, we we don't value intergenerational relationships as much. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see a lot of people in intergenerational relationships. True. Um, I hadn't thought about that. With with, you know, people who are 10 or 15 years older than them or 10 or 15 years younger than them. Um, you don't see that as, as often. It's not as common. Um, and although, again, working in Adoption Mosaic and, and in the adaptive community, I, I do have the, va I have the privilege and have been able to see the value of interacting with younger and older adoptees. Right. And that there's, you know, there is commonality there. And there and there are some things that aren't as relevant as they once were. But I think that's the point. I mean, for me, that's the point. Like, what is relevant to me? I don't want to be relevant to people 20 years younger than I am. Exactly. And it's it's being open to that and keyed into what those those differences. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, what we're seeing is that it's kind of the same. Yeah, I was I was hearing some common things that I've heard. But I didn't. So within the domestic adoptee world, the, the original birth certificates aren't a big issue. I think with younger younger folks, um, mm. but I heard a lot of the same issues I hear from intercountry adoptees being um, talked about by these university students as well that yeah. were similar. Yeah. Yeah. But I wish uh, Adoption Mosaic all the luck because I think it's a fantastic, um, well, company, um, but organization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or, <laughs> we're just rolling in the profits. And, uh, <laughs> um, but no, putting on some really fantastic program. Could you say a few things or um, some of the programs you've uh, got coming up that um, people may be really interested in? Uh, yes. Yeah. So our next We the Experts Adoptee Speaker Series panel is... Saturday, February 12th, and it is four panelists talking about transracial adoptee identity. Um, the following week, Saturday, um, February 19th, is our um, Ally Edition panel, and it will be adult children of adoptees talking about race and identity. Oh, interesting. So adult yeah. children, they may not be adopted themselves, but they're the children of the adopted people. Yeah, they are, they'll be adult children who are biological to their parents, and their parents are adoptees. Right. And then on the topic of money, you do charge for these um, discussions, but you do not turn any adopted people away. Um, Correct. And I would encourage those who can't afford to certainly pay for the um the programming, but also kick in a donation for the what you all use to pay for those who can't afford to attend. Yeah, and I would encourage so people. Is, to, yeah. I would encourage people to do that every time. Just make it yeah, a practice. Yeah, it's make it's it a practice that when you sign up. Yeah, yeah, but there is the yeah. We do have funds available for any adoptee who wants to attend. Um, and and can't due to financial hardship. So and then also just as a reminder that there are non-adopted people who do attend. We the experts, um, but they do not participate in the chat or ask questions of the panelists. It's um, the chat and questions are reserved for adoptees only. Right. I think it's an important point, and I think you also have someone sign a waiver that they are aware of that policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. All non-adopted people. Right. agree to those terms i think that's great well we'll put in the show notes we'll put um links to those upcoming programs and um you know adoptees united will certainly promote others as you come as you uh, develop them because i think i think i had a, we had a conversation with Ostrid a couple of weeks ago or maybe it was this past week where 
there's no competition in producing this programming. I mean, right. It's great right. programming. And so I'm going to promote as, as much as I can great programming that's out there, even though Adopties United or anyone else may be trying to do the same thing. I, I just, there's, I don't think you can have enough. There's, actually. Yeah, exactly. There can't be enough right. or too much. Right. It's all different, but it's all valuable. Right. Oh, and I guess our next, um, our next conscious adoption adaptive parent education course coming up is in March and it is called tough conversations. And that's for any adoptive parents and any, um, and any, in any area of parenting pre adopt currently parenting have children who are adults adopted children who are adults. Um, but it, again, like we mentioned before, it, these are great opportunities to build that adaptive parent community that um, people who really want to talk about adoption, not mm -hmm. just congratulate each other for being a part of the community, but really be critical and, but kind thinkers about adoption. And you also have, a, I think you also have a program called seasoned parents or is that what yeah. you just talked about? <clears throat> um, seasoned parents is specifically for, uh, adoptive parents who have adult children. Okay. Yeah. And I should get my, and um, that, and I should get my mom to do that. Yeah. I mean, and she's I in think her, that she's was in just... her eighties and she grew up in this world where you didn't really, there weren't no, there were no adoptive parent communities. I think she would, right. uh, I think she actually would enjoy it. So hi mom, if you're out there listening and you should, yeah, should absolutely. look into it. <laughs> it begins in April. It's Tuesdays. All right. Tuesday evenings starting in April. All right. Um, and there and there have been parents in their eighties. Well, that. it's good to hear. Yeah. 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 I, I think that because uh, it's... that would be interesting if my mom took that. That'd be great. Yeah. She we had always, a lot of good things. Asha and I Asha and I always joke as like as adoptees, like we need so like in this in this one way we need so little for our parents, like just seeing them make any effort <laughs> is so satisfying. Well, well, I've been on the sessions obviously where your was it your parents that were on and on one of your oh, ostrids. Ostrids parents, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. just in in some ways it's a little shocking to me because you're not used to that. Yeah. You're, it's like, oh, what's going on here? But in the other ways it was very um um uh, I know it's really, really nice to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that you have to get used to, which is odd that you have to get used to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because often we keep our spaces so separate. Like absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And yet, it really is an encompassing experience, right? Like what I feel as an adoptee also involves my adoptive parents or my siblings. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, we've so infrequently have really deep conversations about that. Right. And some of that is just due to language. Some of that is due to, um, I think, again, going back to that idea of it kind of shakes the foundation of, you know, what you feel your family is and people don't like to do that. Right. And yet in adoption, I think we should learn how to do that. No, oh, definitely. Because I mean, we're, um, I, I, I thought we were going to end this like 10 minutes ago and, and um, here we go. Oh. <laughs> but but yeah. I, well, there's one question. It's like, I don't, I always think, and I don't, I don't know if I'm off on the wrong track. Sometimes I think of adoption as a um, power discrepancy and there's some power dynamics that are going on within the relationship you have with your adoptive parents. And that power relationship is, is essentially embedded in how adoption develops as an industry and uh, do you ever analyze yeah. it in that in that way i mean do you ever think of it as a well yeah like so for instance we we lack autonomy often as adopted people because our autonomy is in many respects taken away and it's never really restored whatever restore restoration means and so when i i have a i had a program on annulment that's what i'll be talking about ostrich about is annulment and post-adoption services how can they you know be complementary actually um yeah but i i have defined or looked at annulment as a power differential and i'm I'm not quite sure that i've got that right so it'd be good to talk to her mm. about that yeah yeah 
Oh, although I can definitely see how it, how you can look at it that way because it is in this one way. I mean, I think especially if you've suffered under the power structure, right? And um, that's to really move yourself from that. I think that, is could be really important. To right, suffer. and that's really what I'm talking about. It's, I don't think I, I really don't think adapted people will willy nilly annul their adoptions. I think there's going to be a really no, strong. No. A strong um, feeling that, that it's necessary for them to regain something that they've lost long ago. Yeah, if they can. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so that'll be good. I, yeah. I, I, hopefully, a really good conversation with Ostrid about that as well.